Let's just pray again. Lord, uh, I just ask that now as I start to speak here, that your spirit speaks through me, that you open my heart, keep it open, that you can flow freely, and that all the people here, that their hearts are also open so that uh, they can receive freely what you want to say. Um, I feel like you kind of got me into this situation, and it's kind of on you, so it's your problem. I'm just going to roll with it. Amen. Amen. Um, so yeah, like Erna said, uh, most of this is just going to be kind of like lessons I've learned out of my own little journey for the past few years. Um, when I was talking with Erna one day, telling her these things, I was like, I think God like wants me to talk about this stuff. And then she's like, well, that's funny. <laughs> we need someone to talk. So... Uh, kind of feel like that was God. And then after I agreed to that, I kind of had some ideas and, and then I really just hardcore disconnected. And through that process, I was really upset with God. Like what, what is going on now? Like I need to be connected and I need to be like, you know, like close to you and, and whatever for this meeting that's going to happen. And I, you know, and now I feel like I'm so far away from you and what is going on. And, um, through that experience, God actually gave me what I'm going to talk about for the first bit today. So it's kind of going to be a story. But first, I guess I want to read something uh, that it's roughly based on. So we got John 8 and the first few verses. So towards the end of the day, Jesus left the temple and he went out of the city to the top of the hill called Mount of Olives to spend some time in prayer. The following morning, he went back to the temple and sat in the courtyard to teach, even though the week-long feast was over. Soon a crowd gathered around him to listen to what he had to say. While he was teaching, the scribes and Pharisees dragged in a prostitute who they had tricked into adultery so they could use her to confront Jesus. This is kind of like a paraphrased Bible. Uh, so if you're reading in other versions, it might not say everything the same, but I just like it for, for what it's saying here. Um, they pushed her forward towards him and said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. What should we do with her? Moses told us that such a person should be stoned to death. What do you say? They did this to trap him in his own words so they could arrest him without causing a riot. But Jesus ignored their question. He bent down and with his finger started writing on the ground. They kept asking what he thought they should do with the woman. Finally, he straightened up and he looked at them and he said, any one of you who has never sinned, let him be the first one to throw a stone. Then he bent back down and started writing again. This time, the leaders looked at what he was doing and saw traced before them their own secret sins and their part in trapping the woman. And again, this guy, like the Bible doesn't actually say necessarily that it was their sins, but this guy is an Adventist and draws out of Ellen White stuff. So it's good for the story. So convicted of their own sins, they quietly left, beginning with the older ones until they were all gone. Now only Jesus and the woman were left. Then Jesus straightened up and said to the woman, who was still trembling in fear at hearing the words of her death sentence, and he said, where are those who accuse you? And it, it looks like they're all gone. There's no one here to condemn you. She looked up and said, you're right, Lord, there's not one. And Jesus responded, well, I'm not going to condemn you either. I've forgiven you. So... You may go, but leave your life of sin. And Ellen White talks about that a bit, and that says that that was Mary Magdalene, right? Um, who we know the story of. The Bible says that Jesus cast seven devils out of her. And uh, so I've kind of, I like illustrations a lot, and there's no better way I find to share an experience and through an illustration. And so I've, I'm going to try to make an illustration with Mary to tell the story of my own life and my own journey and just follow along as I'm talking about Mary. I invite you to pray and ask God to like speak to your heart on this and, and to put yourself in that story and put yourself into that situation and to understand like the feelings that go along with that. Because I think a, 
sin is a is a heart problem. It's it's in our feelings. It's not in our brains and in our processing. Adventists would be perfect if it was just all in your brain. You know what I mean? Like we have great intellectual knowledge, but in our hearts we're so closed. At least I was. So um, to begin. Yeah, this weekend is called Disconnect to Connect, right? And so I'm trying to disconnect from my old views of God, the God that I knew, who I, th- who I thought I knew. And then until I disconnect, there's no room to connect to the real Jesus, you know, because that false God is in the place. It's kind of idolatry, I guess. So this is kind of the story of my own disconnection and then reconnection. So the God I knew, and this is the story of Mary. So she's drug in there in front of Jesus, you know, and just imagine, right? You're in a bad place already. Maybe you need money, whatever else. Someone's like, oh yeah, you should go have sex with the guy, pay you a bunch of money, whatever. And then, you know, basically the pastors and the leaders of our church come in, grab you while you're still naked and drag you out in front of, you know, Jesus, and not just that, the temple square, like, basically right here during camp meeting when every single Adventist in the Maritimes is here, and start accusing you that, well, it's on on display, I mean, you were just committing adultery with someone, right? So, all these feelings, you know, the shame, just the execution would almost be better than having to deal with that. And all the pastors and everyone is pointing at you, accusing you. And you just kind of hide away in shame, you know? Maybe she's on the ground, probably, right? Just trying to cover herself, hiding. And Jesus is there, and he looks at her, and she sees in his eyes that he sees clear into her heart, and he knows all of her sin, and he knows everything, and she's ashamed, you know? And she looks away. And as the story goes, the, the Pharisees are demanding their answer and Jesus doesn't really respond to that kind of goes down and he's writing on the ground and whatever and the story goes you know whoever's without sin go ahead and cast the first stone you're expecting it doesn't happen they leave and he stands you up and he's well I'm not going to condemn you either. You, you, maybe you didn't know. Maybe you're, I don't know your story fully, right? Like, I forgive you, though. I do love you. I forgive you. Just don't sin anymore, right? You got you to gotta do better than that. You just stop sinning. Okay. So you go. She's happy, right? I'm happy. Like, this. I just got saved from death, for one, and the guy chased everyone off that was accusing me. And I'm given another chance. I can, I, I can do better than that, like... A few days go by, and, you know, in Israel, women in that time, you didn't work. She was a whore, so no one would marry her. She lives with her brother. And uh, she's just a dead weight on the, on the guy, basically, because can't get married now. Did shameful things, brought dishonor, disgrace. And that shame starts to build up in your mind. And... Uh, speaks to you. I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I certainly have, you know, that little nagging in your head, like, wow, you, you really did that. Wow. Just mutters all day. And then by the end of the day, you're like, wow, I really did that. I'm terrible. Like, what am I doing? And you start to get just wound. And next thing you know, you just, you know, seven times the, the devils took over. That voice of lies and guilt and shame, it just takes over and you lose your ability to think properly, to make good decisions. And the feelings just get so overwhelming that you just lose control and you do anything to get away from them. I, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but you just can't take it anymore. And so... 
you know, Mary goes and turns to the, the, the longest maybe aid of society, right? Of human humanity, like wine. I'm going to go get some wine. I can't deal with this anymore. Like everyone just saw this. I can't believe what just happened. Get some wine, drinks that wine up. Wine is expensive. And women don't really work. And soon enough, she's Jones and wine. The spirits are louder than ever. Wow, you're trash. Like, you really, like, now you've gone and blown all your money on wine. Good job. And as she's sitting there, you know, just, oh, what am I going to do? Maybe, maybe Shlomo over at the market will give me a bottle on, you know, credit. She goes over and she's talking to him, you know, oh, I don't have any more money. Can you give me some wine? Uh, he's like, well, maybe we can make out a deal. You know, I, I hear that you're a, a pleasurely woman, you know, you, maybe we can, maybe, maybe we can make a deal. Right. And next thing you know, she's back into adultery. Right. Right there. Trading her body for wine. She wakes up, hungover, ashamed, walks home. All the men are lustfully gazing at her. All the women disgustedly look in her direction, maybe mumble, spit. She's so full of shame and self-loathing. And then as she's walking down the street, there's Jesus on the other side. She's like, oh, no. Oh, no. Now I'm going to hear it. And he looks over at her. And immediately she knows that he knows everything. He sees right through her, right into her heart. And in his eyes, she just sees pain and disappointment and sadness. But he does love her. She knows that. And he comes over to her and he's like, Mary, what happened? And she's like, yeah, you know, whatever. He's like, yeah, I know. It's like, wow, that hurts me. Like, wow. Like, I just freed you from that. And she's like, yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry, whatever. And, and yeah, okay. I love you. I'm going to forgive you. It's okay. Like, just don't, just stop it. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, you know better. <laughs> Off she goes. The demons are gone. A little time goes by. It's the funny thing about guilt, shame, demons. You can know as much as you want, but you can't do better. They're always there mumbling in the back of your mind. What? Did you see that? Did you see Jesus? Did you see his eyes? Yeah, he really hurt him. <laughs> You're a great person. This guy just saved you twice, and yeah, good way to treat him. Good job. And it builds. Now go away. I don't want to hear that, but it's there. It's inside your head. You can't get away from yourself. It keeps on going. Eventually, can't take it anymore. Life gets stressful, you know? Problems. Everyone has problems. We all have things to deal with. We all have our coping mechanisms. That lack of self-worth, you know? One day, someone's particularly mean to her. She hears everyone talking about her. Not the good for nothing, Mary, you know? Whore. Yeah, I can't believe Jesus would even talk to her. Builds up. She wants more wine. And it's like on cue as she's sitting there, you know, thinking like, oh, should I, shouldn't I? Like, I just can't take this anymore. Knock on the door. Here's the merchant man with the wine. That's what he wants. Two bottles, you know. It's a pretty good drunk. Pass out and not deal with your problems for quite a while off of that. Yeah. On cue, Satan's always there, right? Into it. 
And then those feelings, that shame, that guilt, waking up the next day. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. Just doing something you really regret and waking up the next day and realizing and being like, my God, I just want to die. Oops. Just want to die. And that guilt is right there sitting on your chest. Yeah. Good job. Just pounds it in. And you just go off the rails, you know? And this time, she's like, man, last time I, I saw that. I saw the pain in Jesus' eyes. Like, I got to avoid seeing him. Like, he's really going to be hurt like, and upset. Like, And so, she, you know, slinks around, doesn't go out too much. You know, he, he's coming over to visit her brother and sister, and she takes off, and, you know, she finds more wine and more clients. You know, you're a beautiful young woman. It's not hard to find clients who want your body. And wine is everywhere, so the bender happens. One day after, you know, a while of this, you know, she really fell low and wakes up in an alley just, you know, feeling real bad. Several clients... A massive hangover, completely broke, filthy, staggers out from the alley into the road, starts heading home, and there's Jesus. And she looks up, and you know, as she sees him, their eyes lock, and that gaze goes right through her again, and it sees everything, and she knows it. She turns red. You know, she's ashamed. And Jesus is, again, just so wounded, right? Just so wounded. And he talks to her again. And he's like, Mary, like, how many times? Like, I freed you. You're back here again? Like, you know better than that. you hear you know maybe he, he just starts crying and he just can't wow wow and she's bawling you know i'm so sorry please forgive me i'm just like yeah i'll forgive you you're free again like don't, like stop sinning like i've i've set you free i've taught you what you know stop sinning it just hurts you off she goes. And the same story. It's the nature of sin, right? We fight with it, roll around in it, we're back at it. Maybe, you know, her brother's having financial troubles. He hears her, him talking with his, her sister, and her sister takes care of the house. She pulls her weight, she's a good host. Mary's kind of a deadbeat, you know, mooching off of her brother in the back of her ear. Loser. Be better off if you weren't even here. You should do something to help him. Pay hey, money, blah, blah, blah. And Hugh, there's the clients again, right? That's how Satan works. Just whenever we're faltering, whenever we're tempted, whenever we're struggling, Satan's always like, boom, mm. An opportunity. Back into it. Full of guilt. Full of shame. Full of excuses. This time, she thinks about Jesus, you know. All he did for her. And those voices are like, wow, you are really, really bad. There's no hope. Did you see Jesus? He even told you, like, he's, he's saying, like, how are you here? You know better. You really do. And she takes the money that she'd been saving now for her brother, and she buys a lot of wine. She drinks a lot of wine. And... She hears Jesus is coming over, you know? And the thought of 
how hard she's let Jesus down and the thought of how he's done so much for her and she's just dropped the ball so hard. And she knows that she knows better. She knows that she should do better, you know? She drinks so much wine and runs away. And she can't deal with it. She's done. She jumps off a cliff and dies. Because she can't take it anymore. She can't take the pain of failing again. And of letting Jesus down again. And hurting him again. And that is the God that I knew many times. I used that argument, you know, as if to pressure, as if to, to motivate myself. Like, you know better. But knowing better doesn't help. You can prove scientifically beyond a shadow of a doubt that smoking will kill you. Drinking alcohol is bad for you. And yet... That has not stopped me. Just. Or anyone who's into that, you know? You can know. The Pharisees knew all about sin. They had 600 laws to protect the laws of God. And yet, what did it get them? <sighs> So I want to just take a moment and maybe quietly pray and ask God to show you your picture of him and introduce you maybe to a clear view of, of who you believe he is and where that leads. And uh, ask him to begin to disconnect that. And open your heart because I want to talk next about the God that I'm getting to know. And it's pretty dope. Whatever God showed you, just keep that in your heart. If you have damaged or been damaged by this, don't despair. Because that's not who God is at all. And even though many people thought that was God, they overcame that. Martin Luther, you know, he had a twisted picture of God and he became, you know, he and God were bros for sure. I definitely had that twisted view. It definitely did me damage. And although I did not kill myself physically, spiritually, emotionally, definitely. As a small child, completely shut down. Can't process this, can't deal with this. Just out for 15 years, just more maybe, just completely dead. But... That's not where it ends, right? God has his other plans. So let's rewind. Let's go back to the start. And that whole experience, I'll tell you, as I'm learning it now, it's a different Jesus. Mary gets drug out, tricked, in, you know, into this situation, just needed money, desperate times. All the pastors and Adventist leaders drag her into Pugwash and to the cafeteria. And all the Maritime Conference, everyone is here. And everyone's, you know, what horror? What, what's going on? Everyone gathers around, right? This is the temple square, like right after Passover. There's Jews from everywhere in the world that are still milling around here. And, uh... <clears throat> they start accusing her. This woman is a whore. Moses said to kill her. What should we do? What do you think? And Jesus, he knows the game. She kind of shakes his head like, wow. And Mary is, you know, hiding on the ground like this. Trying to cover herself, sobbing, ashamed, afraid. And he bends down. 
kind of glances over at her and catches her eye as he's bent down. You know, kind of like makes a face, like winks at her. He's like, watch this. And she's like, mm. And he starts writing in the sand and she's kind of like looking, trying to see what he's doing. And she sees an adulterer. And she's like, oh no, he's labeling me. Like, this is going to be bad. He's going to like, you know, starts freaking out. And then she, she keeps watching now, you know, liar, thief, cheater. She's like, oh, I never did those things. And, you know, the Pharisees keep pressing their point, and he stands up. He's like, guys, whoever has not sinned, go right ahead and stone her. Cringes for a second because, you know, word on the street is that this guy might be the Messiah. He's sinless. And the Pharisees say that he's going to be like this and that. But then he bends back down and keeps writing. And, uh, She's confused at first, and then she realizes that the, the Pharisees are mumbling, like, nah, 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 and then they start disappearing and looking around. She's like, oh, that guy is a liar. Oh, whoa. She starts realizing what's happening, and they're just all gone. And just the two of them left, and, you know, all the people are standing around the courtyard, but they're a ways off, and everyone's just dead silent because they're like, what just happened? And they're just waiting. And Jesus kind of gets down again and like looks in her eyes and he's like, Hey, he's like, where'd they all go? Who's accusing you? She's like, no one, they're gone. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to accuse you either. You've been through enough. It's good. I forgive you. But seriously, don't sin anymore because it'll get you. <laughs> it's not a fun time. And then she's like, kind of like going to stand up nakedly and ashamed. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he takes off his robe. And he's standing there in his boxers, you know. And he covers her with his robe. And she's like, yeah, it's better on you. <laughs> and casually just walks off into the crowd in his boxers. Just chatting with people. <laughs> and people are like, what? What just happened? Everyone's blown away. And she walks home and she's like stunned, right? Overjoyed. Buzzing, but stunned. But the story goes that Jesus did cast seven devils out of her. And so, you know, she's going to town the next day, walking down the street, and she sees the lustful gazes of the men and the dirty comments of the women and people spitting at her and those spirits... You know, those liars, the lying spirits that dwell in the back of your mind, the, the guilty, shameful, you no know, good. The whole town, all of Israel knows that you're a whore. You really think that you can get away from that? It's who you are. And the pain, you know, something drew her into that to begin with. People don't just do things for no reason. We have problems. We use these things to numb out, to deal with our problems. And it builds and it builds. And eventually, you know, she goes for her wine, runs out of money, goes to the merchant, makes the deal, right? Her body for the wine. The spirits just take over and that's her identity. She believes it again. I'm a no good whore. Depressed. Overwhelmed. Can't do anything. Just those, those voices in her head, in her heart. You know what I'm talking about. You ever experienced that when guilt or shame just keeps telling you that? Whatever it is. You get depressed. You get angry. You get whatever it is. And you can't see anything or do anything outside of that. It just takes over. And I think that that is really possession. And we have a lot more freedom to pray that away than we realize. But we don't know who Jesus is, so we don't. She's dealing with this, you know, just, just goes out and staggers down the street and there's Jesus. She's like, oh no. He knows because when he looks in her eyes, it goes right through her, right into her heart. And she knows that he knows everything. And she's waiting for it. The, you know better. And he just grins at her. He's like, oh, how you doing? 
And she's like, not really good. He's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I can see. Yeah, it's okay. I forgive you. And she's like, what? He's like, yeah, I forgive you. It's, it's really okay. And she's like, um, and he's like, but I'm telling you, don't sin anymore. <laughs> it, it's going to get you. <laughs> it really sucks. Every time, it sucks. A little more. But you're free. You're always free when you're with me. She goes away. And this time, she keeps an eye on him a little bit, you know? He's here in town, there in town, and she's falling around a bit, you know? But those voices and those old beliefs, it's our identity. It's who we are, you know? Whatever we're born into, it speaks a lot. You're told that you're stupid, eased. You believe it. I know a lot of people who genuinely act stupid, and they are the stupidest people because they believe that they're stupid. They go out of their way to do dumb things that it's like, why would you do that? And literally their argument is, well, like, oh, I'm just, I'm just stupid. It's like, yeah, you believe it. So you, you, you act it. And again, I think that really is, that's a, that's a spirit that the spirit of stupidness, it's in our identity. You can believe you're ugly, live your whole life, Feeling ugly, doing ugly things, being ugly. And those old lies that you believe so deeply and so well for so long come back and they start mumbling in the back of her head. And on cue, there's, you know, the client, whatever, whoever, Shloma the wine merchant. Back in the mess. She's ashamed, broken, hurting. And she's thinking about this, you know, maybe I should go talk to Jesus. He's been really good to me. That voice, no, 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 no. You failed him. You let him down. You know better than that. Don't do it. He'll be ashamed of you. You'll just expose yourself again to your shame. So she holds off a little bit. I can't do that. But Jesus knew what was going on. And he says, I'm going to visit Lazarus today. Shows up at Mary's door. Knocks on her bedroom. Hey, Mary. How you doing? We're hanging out. You want to come hang out with us? Looks into her heart, you know, she knows that he knows. And she just bursts into tears. I'm so sorry. He's like, yeah, I know. It's okay. It's okay. And he's grinning more than last time. And she's like, what's this guy's deal? Goes and hangs out, you know? Laughs. Her spirits are lifted. And for weeks, she's just having a good time, enjoying life, feeling like a real clean, normal person. But the stress has come, you know? Her brother needs the money. And she's a dead weight. No one will marry her. Can't work. What does she do? That voice in the back of her head. You're useless. You're a whore. You owe it to your brother, your family. Go make some money. Come on. Use the only thing you can. Just do it. Back into it. Depressed. Filthy. Physically. Emotionally. Spiritually. Hung over. Staggers out of the alley, right? But this time, she hears someone saying, hey, not to her, just in the crowd, you know, Jesus is over there, let's, let's go. And she just kind of follows them thoughtlessly, you know. She just knows that she can't deal with the pain. And she's got to go there. And in the whole crowd, 
People are pressing Jesus. He just locks eyes with her because he knows and she knows that he knows. And he pushes through the crowd and comes over to her. And there's no like pain in his eyes. There's no like, wow, you, how could you do that to me? You hurt me. It's not what she expected. <laughs> He's just like grinning. This like a happy puppy. <laughs> just so happy to see her. Just like, how you doing, Mary? <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. And again, she just bursts out crying, right? And this time, he's like almost chuckling while he's talking to her, like almost laughing, you know? And she's like, what is this guy? And he just hugs her. And he says, it's okay. I forgive you. Don't worry. Just don't sit anymore because <laughs> you know <laughs> it'll hurt you. <laughs> you don't have to. Five times, six times, the sixth time, Satan really gets to her. The lies are loud. The spirits, you know, boom their lies. And they have the, the presence in the heart just pushing. And you know that, that feeling when you've done wrong and the Bible tells you that you've done wrong and you know that you've done wrong. I mean, it's black and white and you just can't refute that. And you're like, yep, that's right. We just think it's God because it's obvious that we've done wrong. You feel it, you know it, it's in your conscience. And that guilt, it's like, oh, that's God telling me? No, that's actually Satan trying to push you away from God. Yep, God will say, like, you know, that's wrong. But the solution is to go back to Jesus, not run away. But it overwhelms her, so this time she's just over, oh, she, she, she can't deal with it. Like, I got to do better. I can't, I can't go back to Jesus. Like, this is six times. And like, yes, I know he's happy when he sees me and like, he's so kind, but like, you know, the voices, like, wow, what a piece of trash you are. Like, how come you keep doing that? What is your problem? Why? And so she stays away and she decides, like, I'm going to do better. I'm really going to do better. And she fights as hard as she can. And she, you know, puts her back into it, resists and cleans up her life. And for a few days, it's okay. And she's thinking, like, feeling a little better. Maybe I can go see Jesus soon or whatever. And back, falls back into it, you know, and, and it, and the longer that she stays away from Jesus and from going and talking with him, the worse that everything gets. It just keeps degrading. And she just ended up on the worst bender of her life. You know, drunk every day, all day. And in order to do that, she needs to sleep with a lot of people. No shortage of clients, no shortage of wine. Disgusted with herself until she wakes up, you know, in an alley. Her eyes are closed. And she's like, I'm going to kill myself. I can't deal with this anymore. And she opens her eyes thinking about this. And there's Jesus peering down at her. <laughs> hey, Mary. Are you okay? Let me help you. So I think you need to go home. And she's like, what is your problem? And he helps her up. And, you know, she's talking to him and confessing and crying. And he's just laughing and just, like, happy to be with her. And she can't understand it. He takes her home and, you know kind of cleans the puke off of her and whatever else and gets you to bed. You need some sleep, give you some water. All right, all right. And she's laying there kind of sobering up and contemplating life and just can't understand, you know. But her heart is full and she knows that she was forgiven. And this time, you know, she starts to follow Jesus around quite a bit. 
for a good while. She feels pretty good, and her her heart is healing. She's filled with joy. She knows that that he loves her, really loves her. But one day, you know, whatever happens, the stress just builds, and boom, she goes back to it again. And she's sitting there, and she's thinking, you know, seven times. Seven times. That was so good. It's been months. It's been six months. I've followed Jesus everywhere. I've seen him do miracles. I've seen him cast out demons. I like, I know this guy is the Messiah. I know he loves me. I know what's my problem. Like, I'm, I can't get away. It was so, like, it was such a good stretch. She's almost upset, like, and, and angry to the point of, you know, suicide. Can't cope. But she decides, like, no, I'm going back to Jesus. And she goes. She finds him. And they meet eyes. And he's just overjoyed. He's laughing. He's like, Mary, you know, like, you're here. Where have you been? I'm so happy to see you. And she's like, yeah, I was doing this and that. He's like, I know, I know, I know. Come here. Puts his arm around her, you know. It's okay. I forgive you. I love you. I'm, and and he's like giddy right now. You know, he can't contain it. And she finally is like, Jesus, what's your problem? I sin. And I come back. And you're grinning. And then I do the same thing again, and I, and, and I come back, and you're even happier than last time. And then I do it again, and do the most vile things. And you're like beside yourself, like, what's your problem, man? Like, I don't understand you. And he looks into her eyes again, and he's like, Mary, you remember when we met? in the temple courtyard. I looked in your heart and I saw like, this woman is a diamond. She just doesn't know it yet. But seven times, and she's never gonna leave me again. And guess what, this is the seventh time. I just can't contain it because I'm so excited. Because you finally gonna know. And you're not going to leave anymore. I love you. You know? You're free. You're my daughter. You're not a whore. That's a lie. You don't have to be that person. You can be who I say you are. And she's like, but doesn't it hurt you? What, what's the, like, doesn't it hurt you? And he's like, you know what hurt me? That time at like number six, when you avoided me for like three months, trying to fix it yourself. That was three months of time where I was just dying to like get it over with so that you could bail the seventh time and be done. And those three months where you were suffering on your, on your own, by yourself, all alone, hearing nothing but your own lies and the demons whispering lies to you, that hurt me. But you coming back to me never hurts me because it's another step. And I know that healing is coming because when I saw you, I calculated the cost. It was seven. And the sooner that seven's over, the sooner you're going to be free. That's the God that I'm connecting to. And it was only in failure and discouragement and despair that I like started to learn that because you can't learn things in your head. It has to be in your heart for it to make any difference. And you can't learn about a situation. You have to be in the situation to learn from the situation. 
And so our failures, my failures, my sin has been such a catalyst for power, for understanding the character of, of Jesus to see who he really is and what he really thinks and does and the way that he operates. And he's just been whispering that into my heart. And I want to just maybe take another few minutes, just digest that, maybe five minutes again. And, uh, you know, if you doubt me, ask Jesus, is that what you're like? Is that really what you're like? Do you really operate that way? Can you really care that much?